Amen. Amen. Oh, don't you know the Lord delights in the praise of his people. He inhabits the praises. Thank you for worshiping. Can you imagine if Jesus were walking around in the flesh and he's looking at us and he's watching us and he's listening to us. And he's looking for something. I believe that. And even though we may not see him in the flesh, he's here and he's looking for something. He's looking for the same thing he was the day he walked into the temple. It's the last week of his life. It's on Monday. And he walked into that temple and he's looking for fruit. And he found none. And then became one of the most incredible days in the life of Jesus when he turned the tables over and he literally threw people out because of what they had done to his father's house. He's here today. And he's looking at every one of us. He's not looking at what you got on. He's not looking at how big the Bible is. He's not looking at what you drove. He's looking for one thing. He's looking for fruit. Is there any evidence of his life in you? Is there any evidence that the life in you lived by faith is producing fruit that looks like him? That's what he's looking for. And so the day that we've come to in the story of the greatest of all time is the greatest judge. Because see, nobody sees what he sees. Nobody looks at you and sees what he sees. He sees things that people can't see. And I believe that he's here today and he sees through all the religion. He sees through all the leaves. He sees through all the pretense. He sees through all the stuff that really is just stuff. And he's looked straight to the heart and the core of every one of us looking for fruit. Just like he did that day. So if you've got a Bible, go to, go to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, you may need, if you've got a device, open it up. I'm going to be in the ESV, and it's going to have some things in there that are a little different maybe than what you're reading. This moment is recorded in all the Gospels. So you know it's a serious moment when, when all the Gospels write about this. Matthew writes about it. Mark writes about it, of course. Luke, as well as John. And so he is in the last day of the last week of his life. It's Monday. Sunday, he came riding into the city on a donkey. Then late, he went into the temple. He looked around, didn't say anything, just observed. And then he left. And so now he's on the way back in. Start with me in verse 12. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So Jesus sees what nobody sees. What did he see that day? He first saw a fig tree. Don't think for a moment this is an incidental moment, just Jesus, you know, happened to stop by to grab a fig on the way in, like we would stop in the time of the year when the oranges are coming in, you know, when we see a tree that we like oranges, we just go grab an orange. No, this is, this is much more intentional. He doesn't do things that don't have meaning. Everything has meaning. It's not random. So he goes over, and he goes to find fruit. And there's nothing there. There are a lot of leaves, but no fruit. And so he says to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And he turns, and the disciples heard him say it, and he walks away. Now, it looks like, just on the surface, that Jesus got mad at a tree. Because there were no figs on it. He just walked up a tree, and it didn't have figs, so he got mad. But Mark says, no, it wasn't the season for figs. So we know Jesus didn't walk up and get mad at a tree. So what was he doing? He's looking for what he's looking for today. You see, this is an object lesson. This is why I love Jesus. He was so good at taking, I'm a visual learner. I need to see it. 
He takes things in our life. He takes stuff in the world around us, and he makes this incredible lesson. And this is an object lesson, and so is the next thing he does. And they're both related because they both have to do with what he despises, and that's barrenness. He didn't curse the fig tree because he was mad at it. He was cursing barrenness. And it wasn't a fig tree that he had in mind. It was his people. It was the temple. It was all of us. So imagine he walks up to this tree and he sees leaves and he's looking, but there's no fruit. You see, in that day, like today, religion was really good with leaves. In fact, religion is all about leaves. Relationship is about fruit. Leaves are about the appearance. He's looking for substance. Leaves are about the image. He wants the real thing. Leaves are about appearing, appearance and making sure people think we have fruit. Jesus is the greatest judge. He sees through it. He sees the truth. And so he curses the tree. We're going to read in a moment. When they walked by it, it had died. It had withered. Simon Peter becomes Captain Obvious and points out to Jesus that the tree is dead. And I'm sure that helped Jesus because he wouldn't have had a clue if Peter hadn't said something. Have you ever had something that was supposed to bear fruit and it didn't? You ever planted something, tomato, whatever? We had tomatoes one time, couldn't get any fruit, couldn't get a tomato off of them. We got a special gift 11 years ago, 12 years ago now, from a man in the church, wonderful gift, an avocado tree. I didn't like avocados until I married Rachel. She loved them. She grew up eating them, loved them, and so she got me hooked on them. So now I love avocados. We love avocados. I'm telling you, we were dreaming of avocado. We were dreaming of guacamole every night. I mean, you know, it's just, <laughs> come on, it's just what you do. You just love, she, she can cut them open and slice them here. You want something, put a little salt on it. Oh, my goodness. So this tree we got, first year, second year, third year, started growing. It looked great. There wasn't anything on it. Just some beautiful leaves. Fourth year, I was patient. Had grace. Fifth year, somebody told me, said, oh, yeah, it takes seven years for him to bear us. Well, okay, I got two more years in me, I guess. Seventh year came, nothing. Eighth year, nothing. Ninth year, nothing. I mean, I've stood out in the backyard staring at that tree, talking to it. I've looked at that avocado tree and said, you know what? I don't know what your problem is. But I'm going to tell you, I know who made you. And I'm going to ask him to curse you if you don't get this fruit. <laughs> I want it in my hand. I want some fruit. I want an avocado. Nothing. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, it died. <laughs> this is an actual branch from the tree. <laughs> there it is. That's it. And that tree frustrated me to no end, just simply because I wanted avocados. I thought, how cool would it be? Thankfully, another friend heard my dilemma once, and this past Friday, he came and gave me two new avocado trees. <laughs> Somebody told me, he said, well, you need a, it needs a mate. You need a mate. You, they, they have to have another avocado tree. And I'm like, well, do I need to marry him in the sight of God? I mean, what is this... <laughs> What's appropriate going on in our backyard? I just want to make sure. (laughs) You got trees breeding back there. So there it is. Now, my question to you is, you want to look like this? No. Nobody. That's what Jesus saw. The fig tree is a lesson to all of us. And, And here's the lesson. We were made to bear fruit. We were made to reproduce The character of Christ. Fruit in the New Testament means two things, okay? Remember this. Two things when you see the word fruit. It will mean either the character of Jesus, which is simple. You understand that. It just means you start acting like Jesus. You start doing things Jesus would do. You you start thinking like Jesus. You see people like Jesus sees them. And and you just begin to evidence a love in your life that, that you didn't have before. I can tell you, it was one of the most obvious fruits in my life in college when he changed my life. 
oh my goodness, it, it changed the way I thought, changed the way I saw people, the way I acted, the way I spoke. I mean, you know, friends of mine wondered what was wrong with me. They didn't hear words they used to hear. I mean, it just changes everything, right? That's the character of Christ. There's another meaning for fruit, and that is a witness to Christ. Fruit means a witness to Christ. It, it means that you are sharing Christ with others. You're, you're living an example to others. It, that's probably the most natural use of the word fruit. It means you're reproducing Christ. And, and there are people that are coming to Christ because of your witness. And, and I don't want to make it complicated because it's really pretty simple. You know what the first step is to bearing fruit? Baptism. I went in to see every one of them that were baptized. And I told them, I said, this is fruit. This is what pleases God. Why? Because you're giving a witness to the world today that, that you're not ashamed of Jesus Christ. And every one of us who see your baptism, we see Jesus in that moment. Because we know that Jesus changed your life. So I'm just going to encourage you. If you've never been baptized, next weekend we're going to have a special baptismal time. If you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you. Take the step that is the most basic to bearing fruit. In fact, I'll take it one step further. Do you want to look like this the rest of your life? You want your life to God, to God and to Jesus and others look like this? No. Take the first step of baptism. Because I'm convinced if you're not willing to take the most basic step of bearing fruit, I don't think you're going to take any step. It is the first step we take. It's what Jesus told us. And so unless we want to look like this, be baptized. Now, some of you have already been baptized, and that's awesome. You've already taken that step. What are other things? Well, are you doing things to grow? Are you doing things to be a witness to others? You know, we got Easter coming up. Let me give you a great idea. Uh, there's a little card you got on the way in. I don't know what happened to mine. The card says, sit with me. Easter would be a great time for you to invite somebody and just say, hey, will you come sit with me this Easter? I want you to come to my church. Because I promise you, I will make this promise. You bring your friends, they're going to hear about Jesus Christ. I promise you that. They're not going to hear about politics. They're not going to hear about something else. They're going to hear about Jesus Christ and how he beat death and came back from the grave. And there is nothing he can't do in their life, in my life. So give them a card. It's a very simple way, but it may be the best thing to do just to bear witness and bear fruit. You know what the secret of bearing fruit is? I know what it is. It's trying to act like we got fruit. So you know what we do? We're really good at this. Well, you know, I'm just going to tie me some fruit on so I look like I'm doing great. And so what happens in religion and what happens with man-made stuff is we tie fruit on. So that when people see us, they think, oh, wow, look. Hey, you got a big Bible. I got that big ESV study Bible. You need a servant child to carry it. I mean, it's, it's huge. We start kind of talking the lingo. We showing up in church and all that, but it's all pretense. Our heart hadn't changed. We don't act any different. We just try to fool everybody else. Well, you know what? You can. But who is the greatest judge? Jesus. He sees right through it. Right through it. And he knows what fruit you tied on to the tree. You see, fruit is not to be tied on the tree. Fruit is produced by the tree. Fruit is something that comes from inside. And you know what is the easiest way to bear fruit? Abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. Jesus himself, John 15, that's the night before he was crucified, he taught this principle. He says, whoever abides in me and I in him he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Say nothing. 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 So apart from Christ, you better be good at tying fruit on. Because you won't produce any. But when you abide in him, when you walk with him, when you spend time with him, it is the natural flow of your life that you begin to act like him. You have the character of Christ, and you begin to talk to people about him. You begin to invite people. It's not unnatural for you. Why? Because he is so much a part of your life. He's changed your life. So when Jesus walked away from the fig tree, 
It was a lesson about what he wants for every one of us. He doesn't want us to look like the dead limb. He wants us to bear fruit. So then he turns and he goes and he sees something else, the temple. And the temple's problem was the same thing that he showed in the fig tree, barrenness. So let's read what happens when he gets to the temple. Now, I, I will warn you, this passage has a whole lot of uh, possibilities. Let me just say that. And you can read a lot of commentators, and they'll go all over the place with this. And it, it's a very, sometimes very difficult to understand. But I want to try to make it as simple as I can to know what had happened and why Jesus did what he did. He never did this any other time. There's only one moment in his life when he demonstrated a righteous indignation. And it was over what he saw happening in the temple. Okay? So this is a picture of our Lord that some people forget that's there. Let's read. I'm in verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard him. And they were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished by his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Now, what was that about? Every gospel records it. Well, when Jesus saw the temple, it's the very same thing when the fruit tree had no fruit. There was no fruit. In fact, I'm going to make it as clear as I can. There's a prophecy in Malachi, and I believe this prophecy was fulfilled the day Jesus walked into the temple and did this. It's, it's Malachi chapter 3. I want you to look at this. We'll put it on the screen. Malachi 3, 1 and 2. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. This day was about refining and cleansing and showing us what he wants. So the best way I know how to do it is describe it in these phrases. You can write them down there for them. The holy place had become a common place. The holy place had become a common place. Now, let me make sure you understand in application for this teaching. I've heard people equate the temple to the buildings we meet in. It is not the temple. The temple was a building in the Old Testament that prepared them for the day Jesus showed up. It prepared them for the sacrifices that would be offered and the most important, the one Jesus offered of himself. But once Jesus showed up, now in the mind of Christ, that building is not nearly as important as his life. And you remember the day he said, you tear this temple down and in three days I'll build it up? Remember, they thought he was talking about the temple. And he was talking about his body. But then when Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended to the Father, and he sent the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, in the book of Acts, and now the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us, so guess who is the temple now, or where is the temple now? Right here. Point, everybody do this, right here. You're the temple. If you are a follower of Christ this morning, you are the temple. This is not his temple. But yet I've heard this passage used for kids to get a beating after church because they ran in the temple. I was that child. And my dad, man, he, now, there's a reverence here. Don't misunderstand. There's a reverence here, but it, it's not a reverence because God lives here. It's a reverence because his people come here and worship. And the corporate gathering of his people adds a special significance to this place. But it's not the temple. You are the temple. But on that day, he's standing in a place. And a place that was supposed to be holy to them had become common so common, let me show you a verse that none of the other Gospels have it in, in their account. Look at verse 16. He would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. 
I, I mean, I don't know how that, I don't know what they were trying to carry through. I mean, I could only imagine. But I just see Jesus standing there and some dude walking up with, I don't know, a bunch of pigeons or something he's going to sell or whatever. And Jesus says, no, you're not coming here. And I just, can you imagine what, I don't know, my mind does crazy things like this. What if somebody said, well, yeah, I am. Who are you? And Jesus just said, you're not coming here. And the man all of a sudden goes, oh, okay. Let me tell you, I wish Jesus had done that in my life when I was young. I went over to my sister, Sassandra. We both grew up as preacher's kids. There's some other preacher's kids in here. Let me tell you the danger of growing up, a, growing up as a preacher's kid. It's not the deacon's kids. They messed me up too, but that's not the biggest danger. The biggest danger is I'm around the things of God so much, the holy becomes common. And I worry about people who've been in church all their life. Has the, has the holy become common? In other words, it's just old, old hat. Oh, yeah, we've been there. We've done that. No big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. And I just think sometimes we let this happen to us. And we forget how holy, how holy it is. Let me just apply it to your life. We come in here and we act all sanctimonious and then we go out and we take the temple of God and on a Friday night we treat it like trash. That ought not to be. You are holy. There's someone living in you that is holy. And so never let that idea, never let that thought become just common. Never let the cross become common. Never get over your salvation. May you forever be lost in the wonder that Jesus loves you. Man, when that song, when we were singing, that song is just, oh, I listen to it now all the time. The reckless love of God. What God would do for me, what God actually did for me, how can I let that become common? Never. That's what happened to him. Second thing, the holy place had become a business place. This is where it gets fun. I've heard this applied that it, I was in a church one time and a guy got up and he was singing a special and it was just, the guy was great. He goes, by the way, I have some CDs in the back of the room and if you'd like to get one on the way out, that'd be great. They're whatever, $10, whatever it was. We had a deacons meeting about that. We had deacons want to question the man's salvation, said the man was selling in the church. And you know what happened when Jesus overturned the tables. I'm like, well, he didn't overturn tables selling CDs. That is not what happened. Let me explain what happened here. Jerusalem, Passover. People are coming from everywhere. Remember the Jews were dispersed. It's called the diaspora or diaspora, depending on where you went to school. But they were everywhere. And they're making their way back. They come for Passover. It was one of the greatest, highest honors for a Jew to be in Jerusalem on Passover. So they come back, and they come to offer sacrifice at the temple, but they've traveled a long way. They have currency from Babylon. They have currency from Egypt. They have to get their money changed. And so basically what happens is you have people there changing money. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, when you go to Brazil, when you come back from Brazil, I mean, my goodness, you, that's just the way it is. You exchange money. Well, I want you to read with me. I want you, let's read it again. Let's get it back right in front of us. And they came to Jerusalem, verse 15, entered the temple. Began to, he began to drive out those who sold, those who bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. So when they would come, they needed their money changed. So guess what? They would change it right there. And the only problem was they jacked up the price 25% because they knew they could take advantage of them. We have actual historians, Josephus being one of them, who talk about the abuses of the system. They would jack up the price 25%. If you had a rare coin, it'd be another 6%, 31% on top. It was called a convenience fee. You just thought the banks figured that out. You thought Fandango was the only one that charged a convenience fee for getting your movie tickets online. Listen, that was so, that's old school. Everybody, they were doing it. They charged that. And you know what else? If you brought your animal, this was a classic. 
Josephus talks about. If you brought your animal, a priest could walk up to you and he'd look at a lamb because a lamb was the offering that you would hope to give if you had money enough to buy lambs, and obviously many did. He'd look at that lamb and he'd go, you know, I believe there's a blemish on the lamb and it will not be acceptable to the Lord, but we just happen to have some lambs that have been pre-approved and they're right over here. And if you go over here, Pastor Danny will make sure that you have the right lamb. The only problem is Danny's over there charging five, ten times what the lamb cost. Same thing with doves. Did you know a pigeon was the offering for the poor? God made sure there was a way for everybody to participate. So they'd be selling these pigeons. Worse, worse one writer said they sold them for 50 times what they were worth. They were taking advantage of people. It was horrible. And Jesus saw it. And so let me just say this. My prayer for us, yeah, we're going to sell products in the bookstore. We're going to sell products up here. We're going to have people come that have a product. But let me just say very, very carefully, please hear me. The goal of this church is not do business. The goal of this church is to change lives. And the mission of this church is to make disciples. And along the way, it takes funds, obviously. So we're, we will follow business principles because we think they are worthy of being followed. But never at the end of the day will our business be business. It is making disciples of Jesus Christ. So anything we do supplements the mission of the church. And so you can see how Jesus, seeing all this and the abuse. And then the third one, the holy place had become an arrogant place. This makes it even worse. You know where this was happening? Let me show you a picture of the Temple Mount. Look at the Temple Mount. There, there is on either side, all of that is, by the way, the temple, considered the temple area. The court of Gentiles on both sides. The women's court in the first wall. And then beyond that is the court of Israel. And then in the building in the back is the Holy of Holies, and only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. The court of Israel, men could go. The court of women, obviously, it was women. So guess where this was happening? It was happening in the court of Gentiles. They were all over the place. They had tables set up. You can imagine. In fact, Josephus said in the year A.D. 66, Josephus was a Jewish historian. He said in the year A.D. 66, they sold 255,000 lambs at Passover in Jerusalem. Now, that doesn't mean every one of them were sold there. But it just means there's a whole lot of people in Jerusalem at Passover. And so you got all this stuff going on. It looks like a giant flea market. I mean, it looks just like a flea market. And everybody's selling something and people are being taken advantage of. And it's just, and Jesus walks into that. And here was the problem. Where was it happening? The court of Gentiles. So do you think there was any place for the Gentiles to come worship? Nope. So when Jesus speaks, he quotes two prophets. It's very unusual. He takes two prophets. One of them is the prophet Isaiah. One's the prophet Jeremiah. Look at what he said. He says in verse 17, And he was teaching them, saying to them, Is it not written... My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. That's Isaiah. Then he says, but you have made it a den of robbers. The first one, Isaiah. Last night I was laying in bed and I just got to thinking about Isaiah 56 and I started reading it. I want you to read it sometime. That chapter says that the temple was built to not only allow the worship of Yahweh among his people, but to invite the nations to come. And it talks about the foreigner. It talks about the eunuchs. It talks about those that are broken or those that, that would be outcast. And it welcomes them to come. Did you know the court of Gentiles was there as God's provision for the mission to expose Yahweh to the nations, for the nations to come hear about this God and to worship this God. So they had a missional content to them in nature. And so now these people have turned it into a literally circus. And Jesus sees it. And, it, and Mark is the only one, it, he quotes it this way, you've turned this in. What was supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations 
And now you've taken up the space and they can't even come. And so the point was being, your arrogance has said, this area is not important. This area is not sacred. Where the Gentiles are doesn't matter. And so you have taken and abused the very place that God intended to be a witness to the nations. So let me just say this. If this church, if we want to look like this, if we want to look like this, I can tell you how we can do it overnight. We can shut our doors to every person out there. We can shut our doors to everyone from the nation. Shut our doors to every poor person. Shut our doors to every person that doesn't look like us. And I promise you, it won't be long. We will look just like this. But it won't be on my watch. As long as I have breath, the doors are open to the nations. The doors are open to everyone. Everyone. We don't look down. We don't look down on... Those that come, we're not going to take up the court of Gentiles and turn it into a bazaar. We believe it's there for a reason, and we have a mission, and that mission extends well beyond those of us who are here. It extends to the furthest points of this earth. So that's what Jesus was trying to say. And then the last thing, it, the holy place had become uh, a hiding place. Jeremiah said, dinner robbers. What's happening in chapter 7 of Jeremiah? What's happening in chapter 7 of Jeremiah is they are hiding in the temple, thinking that if they're in the temple, God's not going to allow anything to happen to them. The Babylonians are coming in. They're worried. They're afraid. They run to the temple, and Jeremiah's standing, I believe, in the very spot Jesus was standing when he did this. And Jeremiah's saying, you think being here is safe, and you say, this is the temple of the Lord, this is the temple of the Lord. But he said, you have not dealt with your sin, and you think being here is going to cover your sin. And then he says, you've made this a den of robbers. So that reference Jesus used is about how we hide in the church. It's how we hide how they hid in the temple. They come to the temple and think, oh, well, I'm at the temple. Everything's good. No, that's not the case. You see, being in a building doesn't make you okay with God. Being in a garage doesn't make you a car. Being in a library doesn't make you a book. Being in a building doesn't make you right with God. There's only one thing that covers your sin, and it's not a roof. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. And so the reason we come here is not to hide. The reason we come here is to find the only way to be forgiven and the only way to find hope, and that is Jesus Christ. So this is not a place to hide. Man, this is a place to be healed. Hey, this is a place you come if you're tired of hiding. And I love to think of what Jesus, when he looked at him and said, you've turned it to a den of robbers. He wanted it to be a place of healing and hope. So Jesus, he pronounces this, and then the next day, the next day, this is what happens. On the next day, verse 20, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree wither away to its roots. Peter remembered and said, look, Rabbi, the tree that you cursed is withered. Thank you, Captain Obvious. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says, he says will come to pass. It will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. So on the next day, they see the tree, and it's all shriveled up. Looks like that. And Peter goes, Jesus, look. And the next thing Jesus said, have faith in God. What is that about? I will tell you that these verses, many have separated them from this. I think you do great injustice to it if you separate it. Because the context tells you everything you need to know. You know where fruit starts? It starts with him. Have faith in God. Fruit begins. Have faith in God. You remember what I said? Abiding in him, you produce much fruit. Have faith in God. And then he talked about prayer. He said, you know what? You can have the kind of life that when you pray, God not only hears, but God does it. And you can say to this mountain, be moved, and it will be moved. And you can ask anything in his name and believe it, and it will be done. It's like he's saying, guys, this is what fruit is about. It's about a walk with Jesus that's so close. It's about intimacy with Jesus. But what I've heard and what you got to be careful of is this verse sounds like it's name it and claim it. Man, I can just ask him for something and believe it, and it's going to be done. Okay, let's try that. 
I'm seeing a BMW in my driveway right now. And I'm going to claim it, and I believe God could do it. I go home, I don't think there's going to be a BMW. You know why? Because what I just asked is not about fruit, it's about me. Fruit is never intended for the tree that bears it. Do you hear me? Fruit is never intended for the tree that bears it. It's for the blessing of others. So when we ask these selfish prayers in Jesus' name, no. But when it's about fruit, the context is fruit. He hears it. Forgiveness is fruit. Man, you don't forgive somebody unless the life of Christ is in you. That's bearing fruit when you can forgive your brother. And all of this brings me back to where we started. He's looking for fruit today. You know what kind of hit me? A brother shared this, and it just began to think, run through my head. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, when they sinned, they looked at one another, and for the first time, they, were, they knew they were naked, right? Remember? They had shame. So what did they cover themselves with? Fig leaf. There's a fig tree again. Fig leaves. I would assume those leaves are bigger than the ones that are on that tree. <laughs> fig leaves, okay? God saw right through the fig leaves. So what did he cover them in? He covered, he covered them in animal skins, which meant an animal had to die. There was a sacrifice. There was blood shed. I believe today he covers us in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so this morning, before the greatest judge, we stand and he sees us and he sees all everything about us does he see fruit as he looks at you as he looks at me does he see fruit well I know last week he did because I got a bag of it up here you see this bag right here people have probably been wondering what in the world does he have this is a bag of fruit you remember if you were here last week if you weren't I'll make it real simple there's a very special lady in this service that comes over and gives me a hug every week. She came over and gave me a hug, and I looked down. She didn't have any shoes. I said, where are your shoes? She said, they fell apart. And I said, well, where are they right now? She said, well, they're trying to fix them, the, the audio people, tech people. So they run cameras, push buttons, and fix shoes. That's just <laughs> what they do. Well, they couldn't fix them. And I said, what size do you wear? She said, a seven. And if you'll remember, somewhere in the message, I just threw it out there. Hey, there's somebody in the church that needs size seven shoes. She doesn't have any shoes. And so we want to help her out. I'll never forget what I saw last Sunday in this service. Standing right back there as we were singing. Girls as young as 12. Teenagers, college students. All the way up, started walking down. Some taking their shoes off and walking back barefooted and leaving shoes here. I saw some just bringing, look like checks. Some had bills folded up. And so what I have in this bag, it was what was left here. 22 pairs of shoes, size 7. 22 pairs. And so when we took the money, it's $2,000 that was given. $2,000. And so not only are we going to put shoes on her, she has told us, I don't need 22 pairs of shoes. Can I give them to some people who need shoes? We said, absolutely you can. You give them to anybody you want to. And the money, we're going <laughs> to, she doesn't need $2,000 worth of shoes, too. We're going to take the money, and we're going to get her out of the place where she's staying. It's not a good place, not a safe place, and we're going to get her a place that's going to be safe for her. And all that happened, all that happened last week, right here. So why do I call it fruit? Because it looks just like Jesus. It looks just like what Jesus would do. 
So when Jesus is walking among us this morning, does he see fruit? What would you show him? What would you hold up and say, Jesus, this is fruit? He's looking. And by the way, I'll save you a little time. Don't hold up something you tied on. He knows the truth. May he find fruit today. I want you to bow with me. Our heads are bowed for just a moment. Can you just answer the question, where is the fruit? Can, can you just say to Jesus, Jesus, here's, here's fruit? And I only ask you that not because he needs you to say it. He knows. But I want you to see it. I want us to see it. Is there anything in our life that looks like Jesus? Are, are we living in such a way or doing anything that looks like Jesus? Are we sharing with others? I mean, are we letting others know about Jesus? Are we a witness to him? Father, I thank you for this story. I, I thank you for this passage. And God, I pray we don't let this slide from our memory that we will forever be captivated by that moment when you came looking for fruit. And I pray, Jesus, you will find it here. And you will find it in my life. And this is our prayer together. And we offer it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I will tell you this weekend, I dreaded this weekend. And it's not because I didn't want to be here and didn't want to share this or didn't want to worship. I knew this is the most convicting passage for me. Because the fear that I live with, the fear that I just don't want to ever get close to, is that after all these years and all these meetings and all these things and all these leaves, when I stand before him, I look like that. And so I will tell you today, I have said in my commitment to him, Jesus, I'm tired of leaves too. I want fruit. Jesus, I'm hungry too. I want fruit in my life. And I believe today there's some of you that need to say that very thing. I believe you feel it. So let's talk about it. Have you taken the step of baptism? That's a great step. That's fruit. Are you connected? Are you involved? I don't know if you remember our life track. Here's how it goes. It starts with respond, and that's what Jesus has done for us, how Jesus has blessed us. It, second step, connect. Are you connected to a small group? Are you connected to the church? And then grow. Are you giving and serving? I mean, doing anything that looks like him. And then share. Are you letting others know? Are you, are you representing Christ and just a witness to Christ? And we want to help you with that. we got a response room. we got people ready. And let me tell you, there's some big things happening this weekend, some amazing things happening. And I believe there's somebody in this room that's never followed Christ. You've never taken the first step to say, Jesus, I believe, and today is that day. So if it's baptism, if it's to follow Christ, if it's something else, whatever you got to do, don't look like this. And may God help us to bear fruit the rest of our days for the glory of Jesus Christ.